Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and welcome to the AI for Good Global Summit, all year, always online. We hope that all of you, your friends, family, and colleagues are staying safe and healthy. My name is Ksenia Fontaine from the ITU, the International Telecommunication Union, and I have the privilege of introducing today's webinar on how AI impacts chess and the game of world chess champion Magnus Carlsen. Now, the ITU is the United Nations Specialized Agency for Information and Communication Technologies, and we are also the organizer of the AI for Good Global Summit, alongside XPRIZE Foundation and in partnership with 36 UN sister agencies, ACM and Switzerland, our strategic partner. The goal of the summit is to identify practical applications of AI to advance the sustainable development goals and scale those solutions for global impact. And like the most of the world, the AI for Good Summit has gone digital with a weekly online programming, allowing us to reach even more people throughout 2020. And before we start, we would like to run a quick poll just to get a feel of the audience. So now on your screens, you will see the first question. Do you ever play chess online? And you can select yes or no. You can always use the chat and Q&A functions to communicate. Our moderator, will select and read out the questions to the panelists. And we, of course, are counting on your active participation to create a very interactive session. So you have a few more seconds to respond. I, we hope that we have a lot of chess players. So now we can see the results. Wonderful, 78% of the audience do play chess online. So I guess we have some grandmasters in the audience again as well. So please let us know through the chat function. And now the second question that you will see on your screens. Have you ever heard of any of the following chess computer programs? And you can select multiple answers. Stockfish, AlphaZero, LilaChess0. And again, you have a few seconds to respond. And we also invite you to let us know from where you are calling from. For instance, I'm calling from Geneva. And actually, let me write it down in the chat. So please use the chat and the Q&A functions to communicate. We also invite our young audience, if you are under 20, please let us know when you ask your question. Fantastic. So we have people from India, from Jex, bonjour, Barcelona, hola, Saudi Arabia. Wow, impressive. A really international audience. From Russia, Privet, France, bonjour. Perfect. So I guess we have a few more seconds to respond and now we can see the results. Great. So 71% of the audience heard about Stockfish, Alpha Zero 82, Lila Chess Zero 52. Thank you very much for participating. And now it's time to introduce our moderator, Kenneth Kukie, who is a New York Times bestselling author, a senior editor at The Economist and the host of Babbage, from Economist Radio, a weekly podcast on technology and science. Ken, welcome. Hello, Senia, and thank you very much. And thank you everyone for joining. It is a pleasure to have so many people online to discuss this incredibly interesting topic. You know, the world of AI is undergoing a revolution. Well, there's a revolution in the world, of course, because of AI, but AI itself is undergoing a revolution, going through lots of changes. 
And what's really special about it is that from the almost the very beginning of AI, chess was in some ways, if you will, the sort of fruit fly of AI. And the reason why it was the fruit fly of AI is because you could track its evolution like we tracked the genetic evolution of the fruit flies when we did experiments with it. And what was so special about it is that we could measure our progress in artificial intelligence through the quote unquote fruit fly of chess and how good we were at it. And of course, for a while, we weren't very good at it. The whole idea of machine learning, this revolution that we're going through right now in society because of technology, machine learning, its origin was actually a boarded game the same eight by eight squares. It was checkers though. Arthur Samuel created this in the, in the 1950s working at IBM that would actually look and create a probability table, very intricate of what move was better and would most likely lead to a winning board versus a losing board. Since then, of course, deep blue in the nineties, Kasparov. And then alpha zero just a few years ago from DeepMind. Today, we are very lucky to have two formidable people to think about these issues on our panel. Let me introduce them to you right now. The first one is Sebastian Kuhner, and Sebastian is the CEO of ChessX, which is the web's biggest chess ecosystem, and also of Chess24, the top chess broadcasting site and the digital home of the world champion Magnus Carlsen. Now, in addition to Sebastian, we are very fortunate to have Peter Heine Nelson. Now, Peter Heine himself is a grandmaster. He earned that title in 1994. He competed a lot in the Danish chess championships in the 90s and 2000s and, and won five times. But what's really special is that he has been the coach of Magnus Carlsen since 2013. And before that, he coached Viswanthan Anand between 2002 and 2012. So we're really pleased that Peter Heine can be with us as well. Most importantly, a lot of thanks to people. The ITU deserve our thanks, uh, as well as you for turning up and showing. But you can then thank all of us by giving us lots of great questions to respond to in the chat function. And we're going to go on to questions very quickly. But before we do that, what we're going to do is hear from both our panelists. And to start us off, I'm going to ask Peter Heine Nelson to tell us a little bit about the history and technology of AI and chess. Peter Heine, please. Hi, thanks for the, the very kind introduction. Um, you're right that, um, well, chess has very much been the sort of a battleground of uh, AI, it's basically a, a perfect way to test, uh, you know, the battle between human intuition and against the massive uh, computing power of, uh, well, calculation power of, of the computers. And this was especially big, as you mentioned, with the Kasparov Deep Blue Battle that sort of went back and forth. The first one was actually won by Kasparov, but the second one was won by Deep Blue. And uh, this was an incredible prestige project, which IBM put in a lot of effort into and they managed to beat him in 1997 uh, but then basically we had some kind of I would call it a moon landing effect in the sense of well the human the world champion was beaten by a machine and uh, that meant that well there was no prestige in his left so there was still be sort of some kind of developments but it basically came not to a standstill but it was more connected to computers being faster some kind of development in, in software but basically we thought we had kind of plateaued and that chess was, uh, from an AI point of view, basically a solved uh, project. But then in 2017, 20 years later, something incredibly happened, and from our perspective, completely out of the blue. Um, well, we had, every chess professional would, would be working with the chess program called Stockfish, which is basically an, uh, an incredible calculating machine. You can calculate millions of millions of moves, probably billions uh, within a, a minute. This would be the tool of all you know, chess professionals, and we considered it the highest authority in the world. Uh, but then suddenly, in a sort of completely isolated world from us, uh, a technology company called DeepMind, which is owned by uh, Google, uh, made, created a, a program called Alpha Zero, and it played a test match against Stockfish and completely crushed it. And um, well, 
if we didn't see it, we wouldn't think it was possible. We simply come at that time. We thought Stockfish is very close to perfection. It's basically like having a pocket calculator that can calculate things perfectly. We simply had it as our biggest authority, but it got completely wiped out in a match against the Alpha Zero. And this was, uh, well, obviously an incredible moment for us. You can imagine that suddenly, well, everything we used to believe was true, we suddenly had to, to, to doubt and such. And also we had to understand very new things because, uh, well, they were talking about self-learning, they were talking about neural networks, and they were talking about tabula rasa, which was terms we had never, ever heard about before. Also, if you look at the picture on the left, you can see that, well, they did chess, but like IBM's, Deep Blue was a solely a chess project. What DeepMind was doing is that they made a general algorithm that could solve, in principle, any kind of games. So it learned to play chess better than anything we'd seen before, but also Shogi, a complex Japanese game, and Go, another complicated board game. Uh, and this was basically sort of uh, mind-blowing uh, to us. And the way they did it was also very shocking. The sort of story had always been we're talking human intuitions against machines calculations. But what they actually created is a computer with intuition. It sounded completely insane at the time, at least to, to us from the chess world, but it's uh, well very much what it's done. And well, I've taken a, a slide here from uh, a book called Deep Learning and the Game of Go. And uh, well, it's the example is a very stupid game. Uh, well, imagine that we can choose a number from one to five hundred times. And the one who gets the highest number in the end wins. Well, any human can, of course, do uh, mathematics. So we will just choose five every time, or we will get to 500 and win. But for a computer that can't, can't do mathematics, but only is self-learning, you can see the curve. It starts in the beginning, where, well, it chooses randomly, which means that uh, 0 0.2 of the times it will choose five. But then you can see it keeps playing against itself. And it becomes cleverer and cleverer. It develops an intuition. You can see it's on a straight line. So it's experimenting. Ah, OK, this worked. That didn't work. And it's a bit back and forth. And you can see that steadily it creates a complete intuition that understands, well, I have to choose a five basically all the time. You can see ha having played by itself 2,000 times, it's gotten a perfect intuition in this kind of very simple game. Uh, and that's basically what they did by chess. Not playing 2,000 games, but I think billions of games by itself. It started from, this is also a very important point of how they actually changed it, that there is absolutely no human input, no human knowledge. They wanted basically to sort of create something that learns chess solely by itself to make sure that there is no kind of human bias. And that's actually very, the very interesting part that they can create um, a basically a vacuum where they are rerunning a sort of, let's say, evolution of a, the game of chess, but with no kind of impact. And the interesting thing is that we got verification from a lot of our understanding of chess, but also some of the strategies we thought was great was maybe not as great as we thought. And that basically has shown sort of the power of uh, deep learning and of machine learning that we can actually well, get rid of sort of the human bias and look very much at the uh, sort of um, well, what the data suggests and which kind of knowledge that brings us. And uh, well, the game I've put on the right side is a game from uh, Magnus played against Mamed Yarov in 2019. And I think it's a great example of uh, understanding of chess before Alpha Zero and after Alpha Zero. I mean, in this position, uh, before we got all the knowledge from Alpha Zero on the neural networks, we would say that, um, well, Black should never push his pawn from h4 to h3 because that would close the h line. It would be a strategic blunder. And you can easily create a narrative where you explain that as being a very bad decision. The problem is that we had this narrative, but this narrative seems to be wrong. Now we would say that h3 is a very deep move. It creates a long-term attack instead of the short-term attack we were looking at earlier. And there is quite some examples in chess that we have simply learned from this, um, well, gained some new knowledge and overruled old understanding. And this is basically, well, machine learning has shown us that they can create computers with intuition. And this has really moved the understanding of chess forward and becomes a very interesting tool for us. Thank you very much. That's a really helpful summary to understand the changes that are going on. 
I'm really struck by the idea that you're using the term intuition, which is a term that is usually reserved for what human beings can do. So let me press you a little further on this before I turn to Sebastian and ask, is it really intuition or are they just, is a machine just really, really good at probability in a ways that we can't understand? Well, what is intuition? I think we will say human intuition that I will have a strong chest intuition, but that's because I had a, you know, 35 years of studying a lot of chess and being exposed to a lot of chess positions and remembering the result of these chess positions. But this is exactly what they do to these uh, machines. They show them a lot of chess positions. And, and well, the point is this neural network is probably the piece that has seen uh, most chess position in their life. So what they do is that they learn from seeing them and evaluating the results. That's basically intuition. I mean, well, the classical example is they show them a picture of a dog or a cat and it has to get, guess if it's a dog or a cat. I mean, it becomes some kind of intuition that is getting that. And it's basically the same. They have seen so many chess positions, uh, many more than any human is possible to see in their life. And they know how to evaluate it or remember the patterns. I cannot describe it with any other word than intuition. I understand that uh, it should be possible, but well, I mean, you asking the questions, I thought exactly the same uh, in December, 2017. And if it wasn't be because I have seen it work, I would say it's not possible, but it seems to. Now I'm sure we're gonna come back to this. For the moment, I'm going to embrace your idea that it actually is a more enlightened, sophisticated pattern recognition rather than intuition, because I'm gonna to wanna to come back to the idea of what humans can do in chess and in life versus what artificial intelligence can do in chess and in life. But let's start off first and bring Sebastian into it with the macro view, which is how is AI disrupting the game of chess? Sebastian, let's hear from you. Hi, Kenneth. Yeah, thanks for having me. Um, yeah, it's having a big impact on, on chess, as we've already heard from, from Peter Heine. Um, it's having a big impact on Magnus game, the top players games. It's putting fundamental questions about what the entertainment value of the human in chess is versus the, the machine and what the purpose of learning chess is um, versus yeah, just watching a perfect machine play it. Um, and we can derive much larger things from it uh, beyond chess, like you're, you've already insinuated. And uh, like I can see many of the questions are going towards this also general applicability of what we derive from here. In, in chess uh, right now, it's, um, it's affecting all areas. We are, we are working on, on, on anti-cheating in this area where AI can be a big help, um, where many of our algorithms are already AI inspired in this area um, and working on the next generation of that. Then also in chess e-learning, um, we are using it in, in the area of image processing uh, for deriving learning applications from there at, at uh, our other company, Chessable. Um, and um, yeah, in a way you could say that this, our whole Play Magnus group um, was also inspired in the, at the very beginning by the idea of creating algorithms that in, a, in some way, shape, or form, behave like Magnus at different age levels, kind of limited to, to that um, intelligence at that age, you could say. But um, of course, this is, this is further away from AI. But for, to, the, to the broad mass market, it might feel like AI. Well, let me, let me pick up on that and ask you a question, because it leads to a very interesting, subtle way in which AI and chess or anything else can evolve. Do we want the world's best uh, chess player in general, or do we want the world's best version of Magnus, right? Because what we could do is we could actually have Alpha Zero just sort of divine the strategies of chess that have never been known before and can do it, or it can study all of Magnus's games and just be the best version of Magnus. And that might be quite interesting because it can It'll only be Magnus, it'll, only, it'll maybe be a little bit limited, but it'll be the sort of instantiation of this interesting, interesting person who has his foibles, but also will aspire to an excellence that, that frankly probably has never been attained before in chess, but certainly will do things that are new and novel and great within the boundaries of the AI trained on only Magnus Carlsen's game. What do you think? 
Yeah, I think it it takes a bit away. If, like you say, you're saying it's it, it kind of takes away the um, his ability to to go beyond what what we know so far about him no? In, no. In, in some way. No, I think it means that players might you might have players who will say, hey, I only want to play Magnus because I want to play Magnus. But there's other players who say, mm. you know, I know that Kasparov would have bit the dust if he was if he was playing yeah. Carlton, you know, in, in a five game or 50 game match. But I still love Kasparov's game of play, game of play, in particular, mm. the sacrifices he made. In playing <laughs> playing styles, yeah, imitating so I'm certain playing play styles. Kasparov. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I personally at least think that exactly what makes humans human, that they, they make errors, is the interesting thing to watch in chess. But of course, there's also the, the, the broad string of people that, that would like to see these perfect versions of a certain playing style uh, playing each other. So it's, um, it depends a bit where you want to evolve the game and if you see it as a mathematical expression of beauty or as a human emotion and mind uh, so it, you, you could have both and i think in a way the the engine world championships uh, computer engine world championships that that are that also exist in chess are like representing one of those strings and then things like the magnus carlson chess tour that we are running now is, is, is maybe more goes more towards the shorter time frames uh, shorter time controls and uh, is pushing more towards the human emotion side Right. Peter Heine, how do you see AI chess evolving? And maybe start by answering the question that many people are asking. What does a chess, a, a chess trainer or chess coach actually do? Yeah, yeah good question. Um, I think he does like in most other sports. I mean, uh, well, he helps the, the player develop within their fields and sort of sharpen their skill set. But of course, um, Chess is a very specific sport in the sense that, as we debated, that the influence of the computers, now the influence on AI. And, uh, well, from my perspective, it doesn't matter if I like it or not. It's a premise. It's there. So we have to be able to, to use it. And, uh, well, I mean, that's more or less the, the point, that the, the players are playing against another human being. But we have computers who can evaluate their play, who can find leaks in their play, who can suggest new ideas. So everybody is using um, computers and AI aggressively in order to try to get an edge towards the, the opponent or try to make uh, the disadvantage uh, lesser so. And uh, whenever some of Magnus's opponents are playing a game, I will, of course, try to analyze it with uh, my, my version of AI. While when Magnus are playing, all his competitors uh, will try to see, okay, Maybe we can attack Magnus like this to the next time or so. And uh, especially before there was a world championship match, I mean, uh, well, uh, Magnus's team, as well as the team of the opponent, they will lock each down in, you know, separate camps. They will train for half a year. They will try to map out the, their strategy. You know, it basically becomes an arm race. I mean, uh, you know, we try to develop strategies. We know that they're going to surprise us. So we will try to surprise on their surprises and et cetera, et cetera. And uh, well, there we use all these kind of electronical tools simply because um, they are so powerful. I mean, maybe it was more charming in the, the 60s where you will get your, uh, you know, opening ideas going for a walk or something like that. But um, well, that's how the world is in, in, in 2020. And we don't really have a choice. So that's what we do. So I love the idea of going for a walk and getting ideas for a new opening or for a, for a classic way to go take the mid game to the end game. But it, of course, raises the question that as we play against artificial intelligence and artificial intelligence does different things that we would have expected, it may affect how we think about chess and then how we strategize and play the chess. So let me pose a very direct question to you, Peter Heine. How has Magnus Carlsen applied artificial intelligence to change the way he plays chess? I mean, he has learned from uh, watching uh, games from it, right? I mean, uh, well, we suddenly have this new technology with, uh, with a ton of knowledge, and we can see that, uh, well, he played certain games. And, uh, well, Magnus is incredibly intelligent and incredibly adept. So he will see that, okay, aha, there is this correction in my chess understanding. Maybe I can use that. And uh, he was very quick at, uh, well, I mean, when I showed the slide, there was a book called Game Changer, which I think was out uh, at the beginning of 2019. And uh, well, he had a very good period afterwards where he was using some of these ideas aggressively. 
I mean, basically what has happened sometimes in chess is that um, the defensive um, resources becomes too strong. If, um, well, you know, with the previous technology, we, we thought we were solving more and more problems. And basically it was difficult to get the game going. Suddenly there is this new splash of energy with the, uh, I mean, maybe, you know, we, we sort of, well, you can imagine everything is suddenly up in the air. It's not clear what is right and what is wrong. And that heavily favors the better player because, uh, well, um, you know, things get out of patterns and suddenly Magnus had much more room to operate in and that he he used very aggressively. And uh, no, somehow AI has breached, uh, bre sort of given some fresh air into to chess where, I mean, people were talking about everything was ending up in draws and such, and suddenly it became much more exciting. Well, now, of course, people are starting to understand it better. And, uh, well, it's a bit uh, on the downside again, but it's clear that it has sort of uh, renewed chess in many ways. And uh, any kind of new burst of energy will favor the stronger player. And Magnus is a stronger player, so he's been extremely good at grasping the ideas and sort of employing them quickly towards his opponents. Okay, I sort of believe what you say, but if AI was so good, why do you still have a job? Yeah, that's a good point. I mean, uh, well, I still go for walks with him and I play basketball with him. But also, I mean, <laughs> you do need someone to interpret the AI. I mean, well, imagine we, we are, it's a, it's a good question. We are playing a, a, a tournament, right? I mean, Magnus has to play an important game tomorrow. He still needs to get uh, eight hours of sleep. He needs to be completely fresh. He needs someone who is, uh, well, whose night's sleep is more dispensable to actually work with the AI at night and such. Maybe you can create AI that can do that as well, and I will have to do something else. But um, I mean, you still need someone to interpret it. And uh, well, imagine we go for a walk, and Magnus has some chess ideas. Well, it's my job to insert it into the AI to debate with the AI. Did Magnus have a point or not? Can we use this tomorrow and such? Or can we use this in half, half a year? So, I mean, there still needs to be some kind of uh, assistance working like that. So, I mean, at the top level, there, there is still use for uh, guys like me. But I think it's a good point you have that, uh, well, in 50 years, we, <laughs> we might have a problem. But that's good. <laughs> it's not, uh, I'm not the only species who will go ex extinct, I'm afraid. Okay, well, I think we're going to come back to this because I want to probe you more about the issue of the human versus the machine. But let's turn to Sebastian and let me ask you, how is AI changing what you're able to do on your platforms to help young learners at chess become better players and turn better players into great players? Yeah, so um, it's on, on chess platforms nowadays, it's, it's about a range of things. So on the one hand side, you have the post game analysis and uh, recommendations that you receive after your game. So on chess 24, when you play a game of chess, it will analyze which, which openings you have played and how you've behaved during the game and recommend you the right kind of video courses that we have on our website. Um, there's the, yeah, the, the play Magnus apps where we have these different playing styles like that you alluded to earlier that um, aren't AI in the in the strict sense, but they but they can they can be expanded into this direction um, and kind of have an algorithmic basis that makes sense to to look into for for this for the future. And um, then it's it's about a lot about yeah the the error finding of um, like how do you how do you tell someone what what they could have done better? And from there, then the question is: Do you tell them directly to improve this this or that, um, or do you derive from that the recommendation, for example, which human coach they should be working with? And that's then the mix of that is kind of uh, our strategy. So we are we are launching shortly a, a live coaching platform under coaches.com where people can, after having their games analyzed, find the right coach, for example. And um, that is basically what we believe in at this point, that the mix of like what, what Peter Heine is doing from Magnus, um, the mix of humans using AI to derive implications for other humans uh, is, is the winning way to go. And, um, and until we reach a different AI paradigm where, where AI is beyond anything. So we have uh, uh, several questions from the chat that's online right now. And I'm gonna ask the first one and it comes from a person named Nelson. And he asks, 
are grandmasters tra training themselves against AI opponents? I suppose not just using AI for training, but learning actually how to play against AIs in particular. Yeah. I think we are not really playing training games anymore. I think also that, uh, well, in 1997, computers beat the world champion at the time. Somehow playing games against uh, computers has stopped becoming interesting. I mean, we would lose to our phone. I have lost to my flight seat, for instance. I mean, there is simply, <laughs> I mean, they are too strong. It doesn't make, make sense anymore. But we can debate chess with them. We can analyze our games. And uh, well, it basically, you know, you have some kind of creative human idea, you show it to them and you get their verdict. And you can, sometimes you can convince them. They say, okay, maybe it's bad. And you say, maybe what about this move? And well, you have some kind of dialogue with it. And that's actually the interesting thing with the, the neural networks that, um, well, we were used to this that sort of would often refute our chess in a, sort of brutal way because it could calculate very far. But now we can also debate, as I say, I mean, by analyzing with the, the neural networks who will show some kind of intuitive feeling. And that's, uh, I think a lot of people uh, are learning from that at the moment, reading books, uh, analyzing with them uh, and so on. And uh, I, I mean, there is a lot of knowledge there, but also, well, it's a knowledge that you will unlock by watching them or by basically asking them questions. I mean, you know, well, it's a passive unit, right? You have to sort of uh, push it to be able to understand its, uh, you know, possibilities and the knowledge to extract from it. There's another question that we have, and let me, it builds on what you've just answered, Pina Heine. So let me, let me state it, which is from Vladimir Potkin, and he asks, is the game of chess where we can evaluate the AI decision and AI can evaluate the humans one, does it help to make AI and humans become closer in future terms? It's, uh, again, this is too, too abstract uh, a, a question for me to solve. I'm a, I'm a chess analyst. This sounds more philosophical in some way, I would say. It's, uh, it's hard to, to say, but... Um, I think that, well, the neural networks definitely has become much closer to the way human thinks than how it was earlier. So I think they are also helpful to, to, to understand how uh, humans um, understand the chess position and such. But I think, um, <coughs> I, as far as I understand, they are still a bit like the human brain, that uh, you can see the output, but which process goes on exactly is more difficult to, to define. Let me try to maybe take a stab at an answer and to say that there's an imperfection in AI and it has to do with values because AI doesn't know what the values are, doesn't have a sense of values and why would it? It would need to be encoded and enshrined with values or you'd need a training set of data to teach it so you wouldn't. So let me give you an example of those values um, by way of an analogy. So in the Khan Academy, which is a online uh, free, uh, educational service where kids can take, learn, look at videos and learn things as well as take tests. What they found was that if you have students, if you hit people up with really difficult questions all at once, the student becomes demotivated, becomes psyched out, uh, becomes disappointed and therefore doesn't return. But if you start them off and have them get a few questions to build their self-confidence, they'll do really well. And other online platforms have noticed that as well. And within the AI, you'd be able to find out that you'd be able to increase engagement and speed up the learning of someone who's learning chess to become good, to become great by allowing them to win. And you don't just always crush them all the time as it's uninteresting. But here's the deal. You wouldn't know to build that feature in to support humans' self-confidence unless you had the idea to do that because AI on its own wouldn't have done that. So the lesson here is that unless we have human beings sort of in charge of the AI and directing its values, the AI just simply becomes a really good pattern recognition engine, but not really at these higher levels of performance in the way that we wanna help humans in their lives. Yeah, but I mean, there's also the whole track of explainability in AI, which, um which is trying to solve this. Um, of course, yeah, it isn't solved yet, but um, that, will, that will have a big impact on chess as well. Well, so how so? Well, I mean, um, when, so when, when, you, um, when you reach the level where um, you, um, 
you can explain some of the thoughts that AI has in in by discontinuing some of the some of the strings of thought, but focusing on some others and uh, visualizing those. That is also an interesting way of of learning in chess, and there are approaches of that uh, going on and of transferring that to general decision making. Um, this is something that is interesting for for all people in chess. So as, as you were uh, speaking, Sebastian, another question popped up, and I think it seems to be relevant to this, which is, and it, it came fleetingly, so I don't know who asked it, it's in the chat, is that, is he playing any games today? And it poses to me the question, does, does Magnus play any games not that are not chess for the purpose of improving his chess game? A sort of, if you will, human mm. transfer learning in which Catan or tic-tac-toe makes him a better uh, chess player. <laughs> well, uh, I can just quickly show. Um, so here, here we have um, our Magnus Carlsen chess tour with the Lindoris Abbey Rapid Challenge is the tournament that is going on right now. And here we have today like the game of all games, so to speak, uh, Magnus Carlsen against Sikaru Nakamura starting at 3.30. And you can watch it directly on Chess24. So that's the that's kind of the, um, the big innovation we have made during the COVID-19 or coronavirus crisis um, to, to host the first um, big online tour in chess. And that's uh, coming, going into the semifinals today, the second tournament. Um, but to go back to Magnus, I think he, he likes to do things that, um, that are basically not putting his that, that help him to relax so he's very much on and off uh from but peter heine can give the better better yeah. insight i mean i mean he's playing a lot of other games i mean i mean we're playing football basketball all the time we also play various cup games and as such and i think um well i think that i saw some research for instance that also debates that should a kid i mean or the, well who is the most successful the kids who have done a lot of various sports or someone who specialized in one thing and they often tend to think that those who is doing a lot of sports actually manage to get an abstract understanding of uh, how to solve complex problems. And even though that they're not directly the same, you learn to solve new kind of situation. And I think in that sense, it's quite helpful that you are capable to play all kinds of games. But of course, there are many games that are similar to, to chess and uh, probably, for instance, playing some game like uh, Shogi would not be so helpful for Magnus because the overlap is uh, huge, and that means that some intuition you have in chess could actually get a bit altered by the input. So probably you need to, when you're the absolute top, you also need to keep uh, somewhat distance to things that are similar, but could somehow hurt your incredibly strong intuition. But I think also, well, Magnus loves competing, and that's a great way of doing it. I think also um, competing is a great way of relaxing. And I mean, well, um, not that it relaxes you, but it man if you're playing a football match, you actually stop thinking about you have this important tournament. Imagine if you play a world championship match, if you are just going for walks, you would think about it all the time. But if you are engaging in something else, you actually manage to rest your, your brain a bit. And uh, no, so he's doing a lot of competition, I think, in order to, well, you know, train himself, but also I think he's finding this interesting and it somehow relaxes him. So let me, let me pick up on this and, <clears throat> and ask the question, is he learning or is he optimizing? And the difference is, does he need to become good and stay good? Does he need to learn new information or does he just need to optimize what he already knows? Well, I would almost think that he only needs to optimize, but that's maybe, well, okay, it becomes arrogant, but I think Magnus is clearly the strongest chess player in the world. So it also becomes a bit of a matter of what is your objective? Do you want to stay the best or do you want to maximize your potential? Um, well, luckily, I think people don't really talk about these things. They do it. Also, I mean, we are not training in a, let's say, organized way. It's not like, let's say, a football team where, okay, we're training from 8 o'clock to 1 o'clock and we're doing these repetitions. I mean, chess is a somewhat creative sport. So... Um, you do things that are interesting. You read books, you follow, see games. Magnus will play games online and such. So, I mean, Magnus has never been sort of extremely structured. He's more been, well, he would call it a product of passion. He's doing things that interest him. And uh, basically curiosity is an incredibly strong force. And uh, I think a very organized person 
will get to a certain stage. But to really, you know, be the best, you have to love what you're doing. You have to be incredibly curious about what is chess, what to discover the secrets, and you also want to win. So I think um, uh, it's not done on a conscious level. It's more simply that, well, I don't think he can stop himself. I mean, you can see that he might play a tournament during the day, but then he will play fun games at night and such. So, I mean... Uh, that's how I think the best ones are basically living from it. I think, well, there was recently this uh, TV series called The Last Dance about Michael Jordan. You can see that, well, he will be the first guy in the gym. And it's not like that it's organized training. He just can't stop himself because uh, well, he likes basketball or chess in this case too much. Okay. The, uh, the, there's a question uh, uh, that, is, uh, that, is, that builds on this and it's quite cute. And it's by uh, Eric Van Rien and he asks, what is more exciting to watch, stockfish against Alpha Zero or two human beings? Well, uh, the numbers speak very clearly to two human beings. And why do you think that is? Because humans like humans. Humans don't love to watch something that is better than them and has no flaws. Like, uh, just like, will we ever want to watch the 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 FIFA version of um, two of two football teams against each other no like it's completely meaningless um, well okay I mean maybe one day maybe one day we say okay we have abstracted all of our knowledge into these and they make the perfect moves but it's still it's just one one level removed from us and that removes empathy and therefore interest from us but that's that's so how long. I feel about it. I mean, it takes so long. I mean, even the Blitz game that's being played by Carlson and Nakamura takes an hour, but I could see, I could watch Stockfish and Alpha Zero in four seconds. Uh, yeah, you can watch anything in four seconds if you speed it up uh, the recording. I mean, it's. <laughs> it's <laughs> I, actually, I, although it could speed up the recording, I chose four seconds as some of the people online may know, because that was the amount of time that Alpha Zero played each of its games when it was creating its own training data. Mm. It was programmed to actually play each match of four seconds. And of course, it might have come up with a different strategy if it was five seconds or if it was limited to two seconds. Yeah. I, I both agree and disagree with Sebastian, I would say that, um, well, of course, watching human plays is the most interesting. I mean, well, you know, you root for one of the players, you have emotions involved and such. I actually think computers, watching computers play against each other is very interesting. But I understand and I'm a huge minority. I mean, we are... <laughs> 10 people doing it and discussing it and such. And it, it's interesting in an academical sense because, uh, you know, I mean, well, you can see um, they, they try and push the boundaries of how you can play chess. And it's, uh, it's very in interesting in scientific sense, but in a sports sense and an emotional sense, of course, Sebastian is, uh, is correct that, uh, well, it becomes quite insane to sit and root for Stockfish or for Alpha Zero the whole, whole day, right? I mean, uh, well, you want to hope for Norwegian or the American or the Russian and this guy or that guy. So as a spectator's part, it makes little sense. But in an academical sense, and if you look at chess as an academical discipline where you want to see optimized strategies, it can actually be interesting or even say beautiful. But uh, I mean, I understand that Sebastian is working of making chess for the masses and there that's probably a, a wrong turn in that, in that sense. No, but of course, I agree with your point that the, from the beauty perspective, it's nice to watch it. So we have a uh, we have a, a question from Abe Yamare, and what Abe asks, and I'm going to develop it a bit more, is: Do you think AI will develop emotional intelligence in the near future? And now, let me develop this this idea of emotional intelligence. AI doesn't know mercy, and AI isn't cruel, but a great grandmaster playing someone playing his or her lesser can take a game in where the person's going to lose and draw it out by an extra 15, 15 moves just to twist the knife for fun and see the person squirm, right? So I pose the question, will AI develop this emotional intelligence as, as everybody asks um, and either, and if so, will it be merciful or will it be cruel? I mean, I'm from the chess world, right? I mean, the reason chess is so good for, you know, AI research is that there is a result that it's either a one or half a point or a zero. So it's extremely definable. As far as I understand, this is, let's say, I mean, you're also using neural networks in self-driving cars. And there these things actually come into play. I mean, well, imagine some very 
bad situation where the car actually has to choose. Am I going to hit the cyclist or the opposing, opposing driver? And uh, well, what matters in these situations? There you actually suddenly have an ethical choice that has to be taken by a neural network and such. I have no clue how they do this. I'm a, I'm a chess grandmaster. I, I operate in, in black and white and such. I mean, these are much bigger challenges and you can maybe call them soft or more difficult uh, challenges in many ways. Um, I have no idea how they will solve that, to be honest. Let me say that if there's anyone who is an AI expert and not just a chess expert who's on the chat and, and on our call right now and wants to answer this in the chat uh, and also send a reference if there's a, if there's a paper that's relevant, please do because it's an interesting question. Now we have others as well. Uh, and one is an anonymous person is picking up on a question I've already asked, but I clearly, we didn't, I didn't press hard enough and we didn't get a good enough answer. So let's build on it and look and say, the question is, What's the most surprising discovery that Magnus has derived from AlphaZero's way to play? That one, clearly, clearly for you, Peter. Yeah, I just want to say on the, on the previous point, like uh, probably also depends on who evaluates, who evaluates if something is cruel or, or not, <laughs> because AI might, might not find it cruel. No, I mean, I, well, uh, it's a good question. Um, it's also a bit of a personal question. I mean, Magnus is a competitive person. So he's trying to win games uh, later today. So to you know, give the exact secret of what is it that Magnus is most impressed with by the AI would probably be a mistake and such. But um, well, I mentioned some things that we talked about. The flank attack um, was very surprising. I think also I've written some article debating that where we used to think that king safety was hiding the king away, then there can also be king safety in the open space and such. Uh, there is some, definitely some, some new things, but I think also, well, uh, if people want to understand what Magnus has learned from AI, they should uh, look at his games. I mean, he's trying to use it against the, the opponents. I think uh, chess is a competitive sport, so we should be allowed to have our secrets. Uh, Magnus' answers to these questions should be in uh, upcoming games, not in a, in, a, in a seminar, I'm sorry. That's a very fair answer. Even if it's an unsatisfying answer, it's a very fair answer. It's also a beautiful answer. Yeah? Deliver the answer on the court. Yeah, yeah, that's right. So. Sebastian, how, how is AI and strategy being taught? Can you actually, when you have a coach, uh, teach young learners how to actually advance through the game? Are your instructors learning from AI and actually improving their technique of teaching and training? And if so, what are they doing? What are they learning? And how are they doing that? So we have within our group, we have a number of products that take basically different roads towards this. So um, in, in, inside of our app suite, we have um, an, an app called Magnus Trainer, where um, yeah, it's more this creative approach of building your intuition. That is uh, basically a guided path, kind of the way, the way Magnus also liked to play around uh, with, with, with his own chess learning when he was younger. Um, then uh, there's Chessable, which is you know, the largest um, digital marketplace for, for um, digitized chess books and um, applies things such as spatial repetition uh, to, to learning, to learning chess. And then, um, yeah, that is basically the structured path maybe that you have alluded to, where a human also tries to bring the best structure into each topic and then all those structures are basically competing with each other for delivering the best answers to users in this marketplace and users can rate it and so on. Um, and then coaches, which is launching soon is then there are different categories of, there will be different categories of instructors and some, the, the highest rated or categorized ones will be going through a rigorous training program to deliver a certain quality standard in all their uh, teaching that they that they do, and in that we are de around that we are developing all the tools to make them the best coaches, and those will again be technology supported. Um, yeah, like that's that's I think how much I can disclose at this point. Now we discussed earlier this idea that how we design the platform and the values that we put into it affects the outcomes that we get, and. 
one of the things that I think a lot of chess players sort of are surprised about, kind of sometimes pull their hair over, is the fact that it's the last bastion of society where there's very little gender diversity. Where are all the women in chess? Why is this a domain that is really still very XY chromosome? Yeah, so it's a minefield to answer, um, but the, um, I'll just uh, try to my best not to get killed. And so the, the, it's open for everyone, but then we, it's, of course, uh, we, we talked to uh, Peter and I talked about this the, the last time um, that it's, it has a bit to do with this um, self-fulfilling prophecy that when there are a lot of men doing something, it might already be less inclusive for women that try to get into the sport uh, at the club level, for example. Online, it might be more, more open um, because the gender is not so much in the focus when you're playing online. Um, and then there's um, the the other aspect of um, opportunity costs that um, when when um, yeah that um, a lot of a lot of women when they when they have these uh, these skills they also have a lot of other opportunities and and offers that they maybe prefer and that are maybe seen as um, yeah less less risky uh, but yeah it's um, in, in principle, there's no reason why women should not be represented equally at the top of the chess world. And we, we, are, we are having a lot of women coaches, for example. And, and so on the, on the trainer level on coaches, we are, for example, aiming for gender, for 50-50 for gender, gender balance. And um, in the chess streaming world, you have actually I don't know if it's 50-50, but it's definitely um, a, a lot more women amongst the, in the entertainment around chess and the teaching around chess than in the, in the world elite. Um, yeah, and that, that can, there can be many reasons for this, just like in many other sports, uh, but, um, or, or many other disciplines, not, not just sports. But uh, Peter, you you had also studied some papers on this topic, I think. Yeah, I mean, you're asking a, a very big question there. And there was an interesting uh, conference in, in London last December, and uh, the leading researcher on the, the, the subject would say it's actually a sort of umbrella of a lot of uh, different uh, reasons. I mean, a strong factor is uh, just numbers. I mean, there is uh, many, many more males than females who play chess, and that also will make it more com competitive uh, between them. So for instance, well, let's say in Denmark, we have um, 100 female players uh, only, and uh, maybe 30 or 40 of them has actually reached the national team in one way or the other. So, I mean, it becomes, well, rather easy to fulfill your goals. And then the next step would be to do well on the international level, which suddenly becomes much more difficult and we will see huge rates of dropout. And as Sebastian mentioned, I think also there is some kind of effect like you can maybe see in, let's say, ghetto areas that simply because the distribution is incredibly big, like 95 to 5%, it means that a lot of pe uh, females will be discouraged to go there. If they go there, they will be treated differently and so on. And uh, it seems to have some effects. There is, of course, also the debate if there is uh, uh, obvious physical differences that will explain it. And uh, there could be some, according to the, the science, uh, I'm not a brain scientist, so I, I can't really explain it and such. Ask but... um, who you found the, the the former women's world champion in chess uh, this question as well, and she she said there is still at the at the top level the, there is also a physiological difference in how how fit uh, how fitness uh, affects the concentration when you're in a uh, let's say like a world championship match that is like 12 days six and 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 six six hours every day of uh, hyper-concentrated um, uh, activity that burns thousands and thousands of calories. Um, so, but yeah, I'm, I'm not the ultimate expert on this in, in uh, the world. I understand, I, but chess is not so often decided by physical yeah. factors. Okay, sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it sounds to me that you want a female leader if your country is undergoing the COVID-19 pandemic but you want a male grandmaster if you've got a 16-day tournament. Is that how it's going to come down? 
Yeah, and this also puzzles me because it's clear that in uh, other, let's say, intellectual fields, I mean, we would feel very insulted if we would separate the uh, male and female ability, while in chess that's considered somewhat normal. So, I mean, I like that you're suggesting that the uh, female leaders is actually doing better, while in chess it is the reverse. But I think also Sebastian has a point that um, in people where, in countries where females actually can have uh, other careers, they tend to do so because they consider it more prestigious than chess. Well, what we've seen in mathematics is that when we took steps to increase the uh, diversity of faculties and in, the, in the advanced mathematics, um, they started producing extraordinary accomplishments that just weren't being done by their male peers. Now, it's just because you had new brains going into it, but it seemed like there was, seemed like they could just simply, they just became great mathematicians, right, as, as men did. And it seemed that seemed to be an area that was really for men and and not for women, and of course that just changed. So you wonder what can what can be done, particularly with AI, and I particularly like the idea of it happening online. We know that during the, the work from home ethos because of the pandemic and Zoom, a lot of introverts who don't perform well in a public setting are doing really great work in their companies through Zoom because it some, somehow gives them that confidence and protection. And so you wonder if you're not gonna have online with AI, more women, if you encourage them, coming into chess and advancing into the higher ranks of it through AI and online chess, where it, they might get discouraged if they went to their local chess club meeting. Yeah, yeah I think actually years ago, there was done some scientific experiments where they let, um, you know, well, females play online against someone who didn't know that they were a female or, or vice versa. The female wouldn't know if she played a male or a female and that you could see the, the female improvement actually getting better. Sort of the idea was to prove that there is certain structures that was keeping them down. But there was also uh, other experiments that going in a different conclusion. But no, this is females in chess is actually very popular among scientists because it's a very interesting field of, um, of uh, study. But the ability to actually get a lot of females to play has not really succeeded yet, but it's, it's a work in progress, I would say. Now we're coming up against time. We're supposed to end in four minutes. So we have just simply time for a final question. I'm going to see if there's what we have from our, the people online. And let me see, there's, uh, there's two that I think are really interesting. One is about whether chess will become an e-sport. And then the next one, which everyone thinks is, will AI, after winning chess, go into all other areas of human strategy and, and mastery? So who wants to take the question of e-sports? Maybe that could be you, Sebastian. And who wants to take the question of broader st strategic mastery uh, in all domains of life? Maybe you, Peter Hane, or you can talk about both. But I invite you both to close your close the session yeah. with final comments. Okay, uh, I would say yes to both. Um, um, in eSport, it depends also how you define eSports, but we are definitely, we have made it our mission to make chess uh, something that um, many more people can follow. It's much more aligned with the societal values today than that, that we are trying to promote in many areas, also in the UN, um, than, than many other sports. So. Let's let's uh, yeah celebrate uh, human achievement in uh, in in the with 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 the mind and, and not just the bodies and I think uh, chess is the perfect sport to to carry this and to carry all the brands that want to be associated with that and turn that into a beautiful viewing experience. Um, a lot of sports have done it and. I mean, not to look down at any other sports, but if if snooker can do it or darts can do it, then chess can do it. Uh, now we don't call those other two esports, um, but I think we can also say the same thing that if um, I, I myself I, I enjoy Counter Strike, for example, a lot, um, but um, is it what I would like my son to watch, or would I prefer that he he grows up where at least like chess is kind of um, having an, a similar market share within esports? Um, I think that should be possible and that's what we are working on. And then of course, there should be a lot of scientific benefits to be derived from all of this. And that leads maybe to Peter's, to, to Peter Heine. 
Yeah, you sort of asked about the, the scope and the possibilities. And uh, well, the DeepMind, the company that made uh, Alpha Zero, they have enlarged it. I mean, chess is a simple game in, in one sense that you, there is perfect information. You make a move, then it's the opponent's turn. But the, the next step was making something called Alpha Star, which is playing StarCraft 2. And uh, it has actually become stronger than the best humans in the world. But you understand that StarCraft is a game where you move at the same time. Sometimes you cannot see what the opponent is doing and such. And basically based on visual input and self-learning, it's becoming better than the best uh, humans. And uh, also it's not something that is able to push the buttons quicker because that they compensate for. It simply becomes better strategically by just learning, uh, you know, watching and making mistakes and learning. And it, in, in games that I sort of played, you know, a computer game at the, you know, well, at the same time. And uh, so, that sounds insane to me. So what is sort of the boundaries is very hard to, to grasp and it's an incredible, uh, interesting area. And uh, I think, well, for chess, we're just happy that uh, they kind of uh, passed by us on the way and they gave us a lot of knowledge. But of course, their aim is not to build good chess machines. Their aim is to do something interesting for society. And uh, oh, that's uh, very much work in, in uh, happening right now as far as I know. That's right. Now, before I let you go, there is one final question for you because we've already brought it up, but one of the people on our chat uh, felt like we didn't give it justice. And the question was, uh, he, it was Mathieu Auché who asked, has anti-cheating been discussed? Now we raised the issue earlier at the very beginning about AI being used for anti-cheating, but we didn't develop it anymore. So why don't we just take a minute to explain yeah. what's happening? Sure. Um, so we're basically using AI and machine learning to to profile players and how they how they behave to set a baseline and then to use that in anti-cheating analysis or as a hum as a signal for further human review and uh, that is kind of what we are that has been developed together with with uh, with universities and we are going to take that to the next level um, in in further in further anti-cheating AI. Um, research, but there's only so much uh, you can use this for on, on a top level, top player level, because of course, somebody like Magnus Carlsen would often be flagged as a cheater with such a system. And whenever one of the top 10 in the world makes a novelty, it might be triggering the same signal. And really um, that's then where we are simply cutting edge and where AI yeah, will will not be able to prevent um, or or be the ruling thing. There, you rather have to really simply assume that people have a reputation to lose that is much more valuable for them than 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 the temptation to cheat. And that's why, for example, in our Magnus Carlsen chess tour, we even though it is uh, for uh, for one million dollar prize money, we we are absolutely convinced that none of the participants have an incentive to cheat. That being said, we, we have also anti-cheating mechanisms that are non-AI based like cameras uh, surveying them and that, that evaluate what is going on in the room and, and things like that. Yeah. Okay. With this, I think we've hit up against time unless I'm told otherwise. So I believe it's the moment for me to pass the baton back to Senya to close the session unless the ITU lets me know that we have extra time to go forward but I'm not certain we do. So I'm waiting to hear a signal either from them or from Senya to take it over from me. Yes, thank you very much, Kenneth. Thank you very much for your participation. I think it was a very engaging discussion. So the recording will be available soon on our website, aiforgood.itu.int. And we invite you to follow us on social media at ai for good and join us next week for the AI for Good Innovation Factory session to be held on Thursday, the 4th of June at 4 p.m. Geneva time. Thank you and see you next week. And thanks again for our panelists.